you know, how many Canadian fathers think their kid's gonna be the next NHL player? Nobody's saying to them, you got no hope in hell that your kid's gonna play in the NHL. Yeah, it's just kind of funny how you can have hope for for some things and yet, you know, no. Don't dare have hope yeah. for your child. Yeah. It says this letter is to confirm that the patient listed above has met the diagnostic criteria based on DSM-5 for Autism Spectrum Disorder 299.0. Um, and then yeah, just the symptom score is high and severe. I was allowed to go in the room with her, but I had to sit in the corner. And then Steph was on the other side of a two-way mirror. She had uh, started with a couple of toys, and so then she would say, push, push here, like this. But she was saying some of the testing was to see if he could frustrate him, if he would get frustrated, and then when he's frustrated, what does he do? She tried to play peekaboo with him, with the blanket, and he never made eye contact with her. She tried to call his name at one point, and then she tried me call him, he didn't respond even when I said it. You really gotta fit into their box. Their typical box is really tight and really small. I, I knew that, but it, I was taken aback by the severe. Five children. Our oldest is Libby, who's 11. Super fun. Ted, who's nine. Annika is almost four. And the twins have just turned two. that Izzy's probably a good six more, like nine months ahead of Oscar. With Oscar, he has no words, no sounds even that are typical baby sounds, the ba ba da da sounds. Izzy, ring ring. Mommy. Ring ring. Mommy. Hello. Bye. Hello. Okay. Often children with autism have repetitive stims where they're flapping their hands or they're spinning and jumping. Well, for Oscar, it is jumping. Hi, Izzy. Izzy will pretend foam. So again, an age-appropriate milestone is to mimic pretend play. Here, Oscar does come over to the phones, but he's more interested in the light reflecting off the foam cord and how the phone cord springs sort of back and forth. He has very little change in his emotion. With Izzy, you can see there's always a range of emotions with her. I mean, every time I see somebody else's baby, you know, his eye contact is, is not there at all. And when he does look at you, he, he's often not looking directly in the eye like Izzy does. He's looking at your forehead or your hair. Until you see a child or experience a child not making eye contact for a long period of time, um, it, there's something definitely where you, there's something wrong. It's not even just a really shy child. He's actually physically avoiding looking at me. When I was two and a half years old, I was completely uh, nonverbal, completely out of it. I, in my own world, a lot of tantrums and rocking, and, and I looked really severe. Hey. Hey. 
drink? Mm. Bye, bye, bye. A drink? If you have a two-year-old or a three-year-old that's not talking, worst thing that you can do is to do nothing. I don't care what the diagnosis is. You need to start working with that kid now because all the research and all the practical experience shows that that early intervention is really important. A drink? A drink? Yay! 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 Do you want a drink? Thank you! You've got to put the hours into them and get them talking. And about half of the children that look really severe at age two or age three, you can kind of pull out of it. Roughly about half of them. Oscar? And the other half, Oscar? they don't. Yeah. A drink? Do you want a drink? A drink? A drink? Oscar, a drink? A drink? I know, I know, it's so... It's just he's not consistent enough, and I don't know, maybe are we not consistent enough? That just let him have a total meltdown and until you get exactly what you want. It's just I always struggle when it's food related. I don't know. What's the wait list there? Because that's not fair. It's not fair to get my kids services as fast as possible. I don't understand. Sure. 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 What's your wait time? Okay. Three years wait. But now he's five to six, so that's yes. not early intervention. I mean, he should be speaking well by that time, and it doesn't get any better later on. They lose the ability to speak and lose those skills. If he doesn't develop the first words, then nothing else really happens after that. I'm really pushing to do whatever we can to get him to say his first words, because I think then for me, then I'll be like, okay, it started. But right now with Oscar, with him not saying anything, I'm still really like, I do question Carly quite a bit saying like, is this, is this what Teddy was at? I came into his life when he was older, so he was already speaking. We're looking at your book, Ted. So, Hi. that you did. I used to want to live in, in Mexico. When I, when I went to Bayfield on Great Lakes, I said, Mexico's on the other side. Yeah. But it's not actually. That's but actually. it wasn't actually there? No, that's actually Michigan. Uh, Ted was, well, he was officially diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum at 18 months. I want to compare the two of them. Their verbal skills are probably the same. And every time he'd say a sound, then we would get all excited. So that's why he claps after he made the sound. You know, at this point, he could maybe say letters, but he wouldn't be able to tell you his name. <laughs> Teddy. I. 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 Want. I want. I am much juice. Excellent. I want juice. You got it. I want juice. Excellent. Good. To, to have it happen again, right? I sit there and I think, God, what the hell did I do wrong? And why didn't I see it at like six months, like right from the beginning? Because I can see Izzy in the hospital and she was making eye contact with me then, locking eyes with me like days old. And Oscar was always looking at stuff or just sleeping. He slept all the time. So 
I was really frustrated at myself because I was like, there it was, black and white. We just kept saying, oh, well, you know, she's the girl, he's the boy, and she's the happy twin, and he's the sad twin. Oscar. Look. You know, I'd go to the computer and it was left at a page where early signs of autism, I'm like, because I was like, no. Mm -hmm. I said, just calm down, because I thought you were being over anxious and so when it did kind negative of negative and stuff yeah, yeah you thought and then it was we being said, well, like I did pessimistic this, I did this checklist and you should do it and you should see what you think and I was like sure I'll do the checklist and then I started going through and I was like shit no he doesn't do that no he doesn't do that doesn't do that and then yeah you really get pissed off you know because I was then I was like yeah I didn't want to we didn't want to do that that's not where yeah. we did not we were done with it so yeah, it's, it's a bit disheartening when you get through it all and then, wow, we're in the same boat again, so. 17.5% mm -hmm. off, off everything, everything except gift cards. Because we had such good success with Teddy, and we'd kind of been through yeah. it, I'm really hoping that we can, you know, get the same kind of results with Oscar. Oscar's laughing at the shadows. Oscar! With Oscar, just he just is so back there right now that um, trying to figure him out is... I don't know where the starting point is with him. I really don't like the spitting thing. Why are we doing that? I really don't want him to do it because it's just massively hard. It's just really hard. You know, he does seem to do it when he's stressed or when he's really excited. It, ew, that one was gross. We don't want to do the IBI because Basically, we don't want to get rid of the behaviors because right. the behaviors are a clue to what's really wrong. With an IBI session, you look at the behaviors that you, you don't want the child to be doing, which is often is stimming, and then you're trying to push him uh, to, to be typical. This is what I want you to do, and then you'll be rewarded when you do it. It doesn't work if it's he's stimming for a particular reason. I was a rocker. I was a droner. Uh, droner means that I was on a single tone for long periods of time. Like everything that we do as autistics, it's all got a reason behind it and it's all either reducing pain or stress or expressing something that we don't have another way to express. I guess the goal is to really look at why he's doing this behavior so that we can find something that's along that line but is way better. And that's what I'm learning now. We don't want to stop his attempts at expression, I guess, in a way. He's doing something there that, that he's enjoying I don't know if it's a calming thing or if it's just something that for him is uh, stimulating, you know, like to his eyes, if he sees, you know, the shadows or the light. You hear about other people on the spectrum that had the same interest in light. And I mean, even when, in the beginning, right, when he would look at an object, he'd always look at it really close and, and turn it. So depending on what they're really interested in, and which might again look like a behavior, could be what is their interest and therefore their gift. These are some of my unfinished programs. How many lines of code? Did you make it to a thousand? Yes. Oh, huh? Red, bed, I am in bed. 
Fred, Ned, Ted, and Ed in bed. Hey, Ted, now how's Ned? We knew we wanted to start a play-based therapy. And the first step was to create a level of trust with him so that he would want to play with us. Whoa, look at them all. When we were working with Ted in the States, we were actually even following a play-based therapy. Ready, set, set, go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's funny, his reaction to watching your dad. I know. See, this part of the play therapy is is really is good. the good part, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're you're playing a game with him, but you're still trying to get him to use the words, right? Ready? <laughs> Let's go! Oh, whoa, hold on. So this is this is what more of what we want to do with Oscar right now. In the beginning, we wanted to make Oscar feel like he had a, a safe place to go when he was anxious, so um, he could regulate himself by coming to us. Then we could build in the communication. I'm waiting for him to move his head from side to side. This is uh, an earlier video, so at this point we're just using that as his form of communication. If he moves his head, you squish him in the pillow again. Squish. Now we're to the point where I can actually give him the verbal cue of more. And then once he turns and looks at me, I will begin again. That's the start of communication where I'm asking him something and waiting for his response. We call it super snack. We figure it's better than saying bad medicine. The idea behind it is to get basically all the supplements and uh, vitamins, all the things that are kind of hard to get into them. So we put it all together in one super snack. Now you got to watch that certain things you can't give with uh, together. Again, we're still very optimistic that we can uh, work on um, reversing the effects. When Ted was not quite four, we took him to see a naturopath that specialized in kids with autism. And with that, we changed his diet. Uh, we added supplements to his diet. And uh, we also uh, started doing B12 shots with him. He improved so much during that point that it changed his behaviors and his learning and his speech and everything. We saw a huge burst in his words, and he sort of lost that um, fog. We have more microbes living in our guts than there are people on the planet. We actually have more microbial cells that live in our bodies than we have uh, human cells that make up parts of our bodies. And one of the things that, uh, that is really fascinating, that is really just coming to the fore, is that microbes, especially the microbes in the gut, seem to communicate with the brain. It may actually be um, possible to, to change those microbes in the way that they behave. Um, and the easiest way of doing it is through diet. The microbes may actually be responding to the foods that you give them and changing the way that they actually um, metabolize, changing the way that you think and the way that you behave. So there's many, many um, reports from parents, from doctors of children who are treating autism that show that dietary intervention can actually be very helpful. And now we're also looking at trying a grain-free, legumes-free diet. Mm -hmm. Wondering if we should avoid all sweeteners. Yeah, we've got to be careful okay, about so how much. OK. Uh, but the big focus is going to be on the B12 injections. OK. I'm more really hoping for a medical solution. So I'm really hoping that the diet change, and we're doing the vitamin B shots and all these kind of things, that we're going to see a real change in his ability to um, just interact with the world around him 
And then, yes, we're still going to have to work with him, but I'm hoping it won't be as much. I think he still has a chance now of catching up to Izzy. This boom. You know, if he does start to catch up, she can really pull him along. Circle? Circle. Yep. Star? It kind of looks like a star or a sun. I am sun. A Riri? Yes. <laughs> You're like pushing me right up to here. A Riri? Uh, 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 yes, that'll work. Mm -hmm. A Riri. There you go. Good job, buddy. Yay. I have to put that on our translator list. I might get Carly to put it on, put a new one on. A cha cha. I don't know, we could say a riri. You know, a bachi or a bacha or babacha. A riri is not bad for raisin. <laughs> you know? Especially if it's consistent. Yeah. That's yeah. huge. Yeah, exactly. We can't seem to help him with his jumping. Just jumping in place on a really hard surface is probably his favorite. He's trying to ground himself so he feels his presence in the world, basically. When he goes from one room to another, he's always really hesitant. The floor would be slightly different color. Sometimes I think it makes him feel like maybe the floor levels change. And so he's very cautious. There's something there with the visual, like he's had his eyes checked and there's nothing wrong. Don't fall, don't fall. I'm wondering if, if that's why he still lumbers when he walks, like, you know, looking around the room and looking at shadows and in light, or if uh, his depth perception is wrong. So we're looking at privately paying for, I prefer occupational therapists because I think that's what's going to help with his sensory issues. People describe varying kinds of visual distortions. A checkerboard pattern on the floor, the edges will be vibrating. They'll describe problems like seeing print jiggle on the page. It's been written on message boards. Uh, I have Picasso vision. And one of the areas where they really need to be working on treatments is how to deal with some of these really bad sensory issues. One kid may have a lot of visual problems. Another kid is mainly sound sensitivity. Another one may have both. And then you have the ones uh, that remain nonverbal and they're touching and smelling everything. And the reason why they do it is because smelling and touching still work. And uh, seeing and uh, hearing is a jumbled up mess. I had problems with receptive speech when I was a child. If grown-ups talked very slowly to me, I understood. But when they talked fast, it went into gibberish. All of the hard consonant sounds dropped out. I thought grown-ups had a foreign language, a special grown-up talk. So if I said, the dog went down the street, that might sound like the dog and uh, ate. And that's all I'd be hearing. And I think in children that remain nonverbal, uh, they may still be hearing just this garbled speech. The other way? The other way. And stop. Maybe he doesn't have a very good sense of where his body is in space. 
I know the other OT was talking about that as well yes. in the report that I looked at very briefly. Because I don't know how much play he actually did as an infant. Did he actually explore his body? Did he grab his feet and pull them up and put them, his feet in his mouth? Yeah. Did he put his fingers yeah. in his mouth? So he might not have a very good body map. So yeah. we were going to go back there and start at that space. And okay. give him a good body map. Press his feet, press his toes, give him a sense of where his body is in space. Right. Do the playing, play with his body. Also, the key to his communication is going to be to enhance his vestibular system, his movement system. Is there too linked? Okay. Yeah. yeah. The vestibular system is our movement system in the brain, and it registers where our head is moving in space. Uh, you're in heaven, huh? If we can use movement and, um, and activity, new pathways are being formed, and new connections are being forged or strengthened within the brain. So that's what I'd like you to watch. Next couple of weeks, can you get him having more words and so that it's more consistent with all the movement that you're doing, you should start to see changes. I want to go down. Tick tock, says the clock. Tick tock. Come on. Oh, he fell down. He's going to be one who's going to need lots. And I usually find the kids who need lots of sensory input are the ones that I find have the best therapeutic outcome, typically, especially if the vestibular system isn't working, because I can work on that. We can just we can give and give and give yeah. and make those systems process. Can we say something? Tomato, 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 tomato. We try and we do things every day. I do have issues with. I'm not patient enough and I get frustrated when we're working on things and I just don't see the, just don't see the progress every day that I want to see, I guess. That's the main thing. I know we have seen some progress, but it's just not fast enough for me. And I think that's, that's the hardest part. You know, it's a difference between having a child that's going to be, you know, possibly institutionalized or actually having a life, you know? No, that's not doing it. See, then when he spits, then I'm thinking, is that is he doing that because I'm not doing enough? Watch out, is. You like it better when you hang. You girls just keep crowding me. Okay. So you never hold your arms enough. In a cup. Oscar, drink.
More water. Mm -hmm. A cha cha, a cha cha, a cha cha. Oscar, a cha cha. Take it out. Sure. Let's go with that. Mmm. That was hard. Mmm. Good job, sweetie. It's really hard to push, you know? But we've talked already with the older two that unfortunately, this is how it is right now. We try to give Livy a little extra because she's gone through this twice. <laughs> right, Liv? Right. Yeah. Right. Ah. You want me to start making lunch? Yeah, I'm just having to wash the frying pan because your brother was standing in it. Yeah. Mmm. Just gotta chew it a little bit more. No, don't do that. Oscar. I feel like I'm waiting, but at the same time, I feel like time is passing too. Here, small pieces. You like the yolk, right? I was better with Teddy, I think. But he was farther along. He was already speaking. And I'm really struggling in some ways to figure out what I can do better with Oscar. No. Okay, then don't throw it on the floor. We'll give it to Izzy. It has there you big go. Fly. He's still saying sort of the same. Yeah, sounds, but some, some days but it sounds it doesn't sound even like he's it sounds like he's regressing a little bit. Hi. Okay, hi. Yeah, there's nothing that that seems to keep going with him. Oh. Hi here. Hi here. I mean, I don't see him regressing totally. It's just in some things, maybe we're not pushing him hard enough on it. Oh. We just feel like he's there's he's, something he's kind of stuck. Holding him back. We don't know where we're going. We don't really know if we got the, even the right road back, so. Cheese! 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 What's your name? My name is Daddy! Great job! What time is it? What time is it? I hate, in a way, going back there. If it was just me and you were just doing a documentary on Ted and I had to go back and review these, it would probably be very interesting. But now I'm looking at it with this whole other of, you know... Is this what we're going to Like a handbook, through? yeah. Like, okay, yeah, what did I do with him? And oh, how did he get to that point? And was that something that it was a skill of Ted that is not a skill with Oscar? So how do we, you Bridge know, get that, him? Yeah. 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 And, and Ted had some... He had some good skills. I think I got it. Yeah? Yep. What is it? Dear Venus Mars. Whoa. Oh, wow, sweetie. That's really good focusing. Thank you. I think with Oscar, we're just on a really different path. So, um... This doesn't really relate exactly to him because I think his issues are so different. So. It's just, in some ways, maybe Oscar's going to have more trouble getting the words, right? It's actually Venus. It's Venus.
I think we came into this thinking we were ahead of the game and we knew some stuff and I think we've had to rethink everything. Yeah, we just kept hoping that, you know, I'd watch it, I'd flap my hands, then I'd take the plate again, spin it, flap my hands. I would do this over and over and over and over again. And my parents were told, take the plate away, you stop him, you redirect this behavior. But my mom, thankfully, did not listen. Every time she saw me doing that, she'd get a plate, she'd sit down next to me, she would spin her own plate, she'd get really into it. And she was told, oh my, this is like the worst thing you could possibly do. Like, doing nothing is better than doing this. This is like the worst possible idea. What actually happened is that when she joined me, that was the first time I ever looked at her, the first time I ever smiled at her. First time I ever did that was when she was joining. Here's why we're joining. We're not joining to prove we can copy. What we're joining to do is we're joining to show interest in what your child's interested in. We do this with our neurotypical kids all the time. We just don't do it with our kids on the spectrum, and those are the kids that really need it. You will never be able to look at what your son or daughter's doing with the same set of eyes again. You'll sort of be able to really see the beauty and the magic in it. This may be new to autism, but it ain't new to human beings. That the children show us the way in, and then we show them the way out. You are gonna be your child's best friend. They will climb mountains for you. They will cross rivers for you. But they have to trust you. They have to know you're really their friend. Temple Grandin actually said, your, your first step is just connecting with that child. You're connecting, you're finding, like she says, Temple says, you need to find your child's interest, whatever that is. I don't think Oscar's right thinking about that, talking so much. He, he's a big thinking of himself, of himself in the magical world. Oh, okay. Land of peace. <laughs> so did you think about yourself like that? Sometimes I do. And I wonder what job Oscar's gonna have. Maybe he's gonna be an artist like Livy. Maybe he'll be a coder like me. I'm gonna be a coder, an offer, uh, astronaut. Maybe an astronaut, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know about the astronaut, but maybe an astronaut. So would you have, could Oscar live with you if he wanted to live with you? Yeah, he could, he could. Yeah? Do you remember though when you were younger, Ted? Do you remember when, like when you could read but you couldn't talk? Do you remember that time or you don't remember that anymore? No, not anymore. Mm -mm. No. I read, I don't even remember having autism at all. Say that again? I never have an autism at all. <laughs> well, we never thought of it as anything. We were just Teddy. I think from the beginning, what we've been trying to figure out for ourselves is to what extent autism is a condition and where does your child start, basically. So. As kids, we play with the sensory distortions, and it's just part of what we do. We, you know, you've, you've, you've got the beat them or join them thing, and most of us kind of go, well, that was weird, <laughs> you know?
should just be a comfortable listening volume. And it emphasizes high frequencies and then low frequencies and it goes from ear to ear. Yeah. 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 You might want to keep continuing to turn it down a little bit. So this one's supposed to focus a lot more on social engagement and connection. Okay. Each album is designed differently so that each one will influence different kinds of pathways within the brain. Yeah. Heart, star. Heart, star, diamond, crescent. Whoa. What are we seeing? Heart, star, diamond, crescent. He makes those guttural noises because it's he feels the vibrations in his chest. So there's more of a sense of in his body where the sound is coming from. We see things that he does and then we see slides that he's not doing anything and then we see some things that he's done again. And anyways, it's still tolerable, I guess. Want some celery? Health is still the huge priority for us. Celery? The gut brain. We really feel that's one of the big things for him. But you can't heal the gut unless you're doing it with the right foods. And he's turned into this crazy picky eater. Yum, 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 veggies. You want the letters on again? You want the alphabet? Yes? It's the entire spectrum. When you look at most of us, you're looking at people who are pretty traumatized. And it's a constant, ongoing effort to back down stress levels enough in order to be able to continue to engage. Nature does ripples on water and flickering leaves, and those, those little gentle movements are really calming on our nervous system. Soft, gentle, wiggly motions that allow us to come into a more relaxed state because we're so used to being so overstressed by our environment and told that we can't do the things that calm us down because they're not acceptable in public. We haven't seen the spit painting. This is a new thing with the spinning of the pen. Whatever, he's moving through a different stage. We all do things to self-soothe, and if that's what it is, then you still need a, to let him do something that's gonna to self-soothe. Why should we force somebody so far out of their comfort zone that they're not them anymore? Oscar, when he's just happy, spinning or when he was spit painting or when he looks at the trees and sees the light through the trees. I mean, he's in a state of, of possible bliss that you and I can't get to. So is that negative or is that positive? Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, sometimes it's very positive. Maybe there are these fantastic artists that can never describe to you verbally what they see, but their talent allows them to create images that, you know, no one else can create on that level that they do or produce music so perfectly pitched or go through lines of code with such detail yeah and to find the one flaw hi hi oscar hi dad hi hi oscar hi dad i don't see that as part of oscar that he doesn't speak i see that as a part of the autism which again i'm not sure if it's if it's permanent or if it's just a, just delayed on speech or whatever. And in order for me to be able to, maybe it's a selfish thing, me to be able to relate to him better, I would want him to talk. Is it like that on your feet? My beard? Wipe. Shut. Shabu. Shabu. Eat. 
Bah. Ciao. Yay. Yay! Good job, buddy. Yeah, good job. What? What? <laughs> oh, you did it before. You did it so good. Three. Okay, now we'll do it. Now we'll do it for you. Four. Five. Like, how much do you help him? Or how much do you let him struggle? And I mean, the fact that he was doing it with this, we don't want him to get so upset with the book that he doesn't want to do anything with the book anymore. <laughs> There's the saxophone, Ian. It's teaching us to have to constantly problem solve. And it's maybe going to help him in turn to constantly problem solve. What did you want? Did you want the farm? You see the farm? Yeah? No? He's actually asking me for the markers that he sees sticking out of the corner of the basket. The barn. If he goes the borders, that... And I think that it's this barn. <laughs> what? Can we point? <laughs> and you can almost hear him. He gutturals and then he almost says, <laughs> Marker. Barn. Baba. Barn. So here he's been more frustrated with me because it's wrong. We do have a difference of opinion, I think. We still on that, do, I think. On that acceptance, though. Mm -hmm. But when I think of acceptance, especially when it comes to Oscar's autism, I don't want to just say, well, that's who he is and we just accept it. Because I think it's also, I'm worried that it's too close to just saying, that's where he is and there's nothing we can do and you know we have to accept him like he is and we don't try to change him where if somebody was hurt or injured or sick you wouldn't just say well I just accept that they're sick and you know it's too bad that they have cancer and we just accept no I accept Oscar who he is but I don't accept well right now and even I think for my own sanity, I'm not accepting that he won't talk. That's not, that's not in my, I'm not there yet. And I don't want to be there. Red. Yeah. Red. <laughs> in this other book that I've started, the gentleman that wrote the book is gay. His parents at one time in his life would have probably done anything to have fixed him, to have changed it, to have made him normal, right? And he hated them for that time because at that point, they weren't accepting him of who he was as a whole. And that's what bothers me in a way because that's not what I'm feeling. But I'm just saying that some of the effects of having autism are really terrible like a lack of being able to communicate, that kind of thing, right? I'm just saying, right now Oscar's frustrated, I think, because he can't get his ideas out. I think he's frustrated by that. I know. Well, the way is he's not. He's frustrated because he can't communicate. I'm frustrated because he can't communicate. And I'm just thinking, if that's, a ca if that's because of autism, then I hate autism for it.
want to focus on that one thing. It's like, I'm so happy that you can have those moments where I know he's really connecting with me. Even though he's not talking to me, even though he's not saying mummy, even though he's not saying I love you mummy or whatever. He looks now in my eyes and I know he's recognizing my face. He's seeing me, he's happy and we're sharing a moment. And that's part of parenting. That's what you're looking for as well. You're looking for that bond. That's what I think in general humans are doing. That's why we interact. But I think we, we get so stigmatized that that interaction with people has to be verbal communication. <laughs> our seven, our group of seven, is what is safe and what will be with him, the kids for sure, for the majority of his life. I thought, you know, he was going to have more words and he'd be communicating with us verbally, you know, by the end of the year. That's so far down in the line of what's really important. And that trust and respect and caring, safe environment of connecting, that intimacy with the people that really care about you is, I think, what we just spent the last year doing.